The devil can take many forms. Some may even seem attractive. And between 1990 and 1992, the devil walked the streets of Scarborough, Canada under an innocent guise. An apparently normal, young, and attractive couple. The individuals who would soon be dubbed the Barbie and Ken Killers wreaked havoc on the town, taking the lives of at least three young women. And if uh, Christy can hear me, if you can get away someplace, Christy, phone either home or the Nagar police as soon as possible. Sadomasochism, psychopathy, and an unhealthy attachment to each other were all ingredients of what would become a deadly cocktail. This is the story of the Barbie and Ken killers. Did you ever get caught? Did you ever get caught? No, never, never. Why? I'm a deadly innocent guy. Paul Bernardo was born in Scarborough, Ontario on the 27th of August, 1964, the youngest of three children. But in spite of outward appearances, Paul's family was anything but happy. Paul's father, Kenneth Bernardo, was an abuser who subjected his children to unspeakable acts. Paul was especially aware of his repeated assaults on his older sister, Deborah, throughout his childhood. Eventually, Kenneth Bernardo would be charged with crimes of this nature, including voyeurism. Paul's mother, Marilyn Bernardo, suffered from multiple mental illnesses. Eventually, she became withdrawn from her family as a result of her ongoing depression and agoraphobia and moved into the family basement. However, in spite of his troubled home life, Paul Bernardo seemed to thrive during his formative years. He kept up with school, was fairly popular, and was a particularly active member of the Boy Scouts. At some point in his childhood, something switched inside Paul Bernardo, because suddenly, Paul had developed pyromaniac tendencies, as well as dark sexual preferences, ones that would control him for the rest of his life. In one of his fantasies, Paul dreamed of creating a virgin farm, where he would breed women to assault. Yes, little girl. Good As Paul's fantasies kept evolving and becoming even more twisted, Marilyn and Kenneth's marriage was on the rocks. The two were hardly the pinnacle of stability, but around Paul's teenage years was when things started going irreversibly sour. One night after a particularly bad fight, 16-year-old Paul found out that his father was, in fact, not Kenneth Bernardo, but a man his mother had an affair with. Angered, Paul started yelling at his mother, cursing her. Vindictively, his mother called him a bastard from hell. Unfortunately, her statement was closer to the truth than she would ever have guessed. In an act of incredible violence, Paul gathered all of his mother's belongings and set them alight. After leaving the family home, Paul began seeing women and living out his fantasies and just like his father before him, abusing them. By 1986, Paul already had two restraining orders against him. Only an hour away from the town of Scarborough is Mississauga, Ontario. On the 4th of May, 1970, the woman who would become Paul's wife was born. Carla Homolka had a fairly normal childhood. She was pretty and popular with a love for animals that would eventually turn into a job. At the age of 17, Carla started working at a local vet's office. In October, 1987, Carla attended a pet convention in Scarborough. It was then that her life would change forever. Somewhere at that same convention, looking at Carla from afar, was 23-year-old Paul Bernardo. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, the sexiest girl in the world. There was an instant spark between Paul and Carla, a spark that would soon turn into something much darker. Carla shared and encouraged Paul's fantasies. She would perform his fantasies for him and even agreed to Paul assaulting other women while in a relationship with her. You're bad. You're bad. It was then between 1987 and 1990 that Paul would commit a high number of violent crimes all under Carla's blessings. 
The two married in 1991. Paul would stalk his victims as they got off late buses, following them for a while before launching himself upon them. In May 1987, Bernardo assaulted two different young women in the front and backyards of their family homes. In December the same year, he assaulted two more young women aged just 15 and 17. This suspect is wanted for a series of assaults, two last May and one just last week. And police say his attacks always follow the same pattern. In 1988, Bernardo assaulted another two women and had committed countless attempted assaults. This was followed by three more assaults in 1989. The face on the poster is a puzzle. It has to be. None of the victims has had a good look at her attacker, a man who grabs her from behind with a knife. Metro Police have a team of investigators working full-time on this case. They've interviewed and cleared over a thousand possible suspects. They've even offered a $150,000 reward, but they still lack the key pieces to this puzzle. In 1990, after assaulting yet another woman, police started closing in on Bernardo. However, after being interviewed by two detectives, Bernardo was released. At the same time, Bernardo lost his job as an accountant. He began smuggling cigarettes across the Canada-United States border. Two years into their relationship, Paul began spending prolonged periods of time at the Homolka residence with Carla and her family. The family liked Paul. He appeared to be a clever young man, educated and well-mannered. But under his pleasant outward appearance lurked thoughts of an unimaginable darkness. And unfortunately, the Homolkas would soon come to witness their horrid enactment. In light of Paul's dysfunctional family, he ended up spending most holidays with the Homolkas. It was during this time, in the summer of 1990, that Paul developed an obsession for Carla's 16-year-old sister, Tammy. Tammy was similarly to her sister, a well-liked member of the local community. She was particularly talented at sports, participating in track and field, cross country, running, and soccer. It turned out that Carla was just as twisted as Paul. Hi, Carla. Hi. Say hi to the camera. When her partner confessed his attraction for Tammy to her, Carla helped hatch a plan to make Paul's fantasies become a reality. According to Carla, her plan of drugging her sister in order for Paul to assault her was supposed to minimize risks, take control, and keep it all in the family. However, her claims would soon turn out to be false instead. Behind Carla's Barbie-like appearance were monstrous fantasies, ones of control, sadism, and death. One evening in July 1990, Carla was cooking dinner for Tammy in an apparent gesture of sisterly kindness. What Tammy did not know, however, was that her spaghetti sauce had been laced with Valium, which her sister had stolen from her employer. Tammy fell into a deep sleep. Paul then saw his chances. He assaulted Tammy for an entire minute before she began to awaken. Paul pulled away at that moment, but it would not be long until his unsatisfied urges would once again take over. Moreover, Carla was determined to turn Paul's fantasy into a reality claiming that she wished to offer Tammy's virginity to Paul for Christmas. On Christmas Eve 1990, the couple once again drugged Tammy. During the party, Carla served Tammy drinks infused with triazolam. Their parents were upstairs and asleep during this time. Triazolam is a type of benzodiazepine drug acting as a tranquilizer. 
Then, in order to make sure Tammy did not wake up during the act, Carla placed a rag dipped in halothane over her sister's face. Halothane acted as a further anesthetic. Sadly, Paul and Carla's plan to assault Tammy worked. However, Tammy soon started choking on her own vomit and died during the assault. In a panic, Carla clothed Tammy and cleaned up the crime scene, claiming that her death had been accidental. She attempted to revive her, but to no avail. The couple then dialed 911 and hid any remaining evidence, moving Tammy back into her bed. In spite of drugs having been detected in Tammy's bloodstream at the time of her death, this aspect was overlooked and the family decided to call her death accidental. However, unbeknownst to them, Carla and Paul had filmed her sister's entire assault, taking turns holding the camera and filming Tammy's miserable last few moments alive. But Tammy's assault and resulting death was still not enough for the murderous couple. In videotapes recovered by law enforcement, Carla and Paul can be seen engaged in morbid sexual acts. Those included multiple instances of Carla pretending to be Tammy whilst wearing her clothing and having intercourse on her bed. So what are you doing tomorrow, little girl? I'm going to Disney World. You're going to go ball. Do you like Disney World? I don't know everything yet. You don't know? But I will. You will? Yeah. Do you want to meet Mickey Mouse? <laughs> After Tammy's death, the couple moved away from the Homolka house and into a bungalow in Port Dalhousie. It would later be suspected that Tammy's death was not accidental and that Carla had administered a purposeful and powerful overdose. Described as a malignant narcissist, whether Carla killed her sister out of jealousy that night has remained a mystery. In the early morning hours of June 15th, 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey told the friend she was heading home, but she never arrived. Leslie Mahaffey was a bright, likable teenager living in Burlington, Ontario. Aged 15, Leslie had started spending some time away from home with her friends in order to socialize more. However, even when she would go away, Leslie made sure to keep in contact with her family especially with her younger brother, Ryan, to whom she was particularly close. Leslie's friend group had recently suffered a heartbreaking tragedy when a few of them were killed in an automobile accident. On the 14th of June, 1991, 14-year-old Leslie was attending a memorial for one of the teens. The memorial was followed by an informal get-together and Leslie became distracted. At around 2 a.m., after missing her curfew and finding her door locked, Leslie called a friend to ask if she could stay over, but was refused. Leslie decided that she would make her way home and try again. While walking home, an exhausted Leslie ran into a charming young man. He offered her a cigarette and brought her back to his car. The young man then took his sweatshirt off and quickly wrapped it around Mahaffey's head, forcing her into the vehicle. The following day, a friend of Leslie's called the Mahaffey household inquiring about her and explaining that Leslie had found the house door locked the previous night. Panicked and seeing that her daughter was nowhere to be found, Leslie's mother eventually contacted the police. On June 18th, unaware that her daughter had been abducted, Debbie Mahaffey filed the official paperwork for her daughter to be sought and arrested as a runaway if found by police. Leslie Mahaffey is believed to have been abused for around 24 hours. Similarly to Tammy, Leslie had been given anesthetic drugs in order to be kept submissive. Bernardo and Hamolka gave Leslie a teddy bear to hold during breaks between the assaults. And when they were finished with her, Bernardo wrapped an electrical cord around the girl's neck and strangled her. In Bernardo's recount of the events, he states that Leslie died in the same manner as Tammy, of a drug overdose. But Leslie's manner of death would never be truly revealed, because you cannot have an autopsy without a body. 
On the 16th of June, 1991, Carla and Paul hosted a Father's Day dinner at the Homolka home. However, unknown to her family members, Carla was hiding Leslie's body in the basement. And after the dinner had been wrapped up, the killers used the family's circular saw to dis the young girl's body. They would then encase Mahaffey's body in concrete and throw it into Lake Gibson. Leslie Mahaffey was identified through dental records. 15-year-old Kristen French, a high school athlete and a straight-A student, was abducted from the front lawn of this church near her home this afternoon. Kristen Dawn French was born in 1976 and lived in St. Catharines, Ontario. French was an athlete taking part in precision ice skating as well as rowing. But what started out as a regular school day for the 15-year-old would soon become a nightmare. On April 16th, while walking back from school, French was approached by Homolka and Bernardo in a nearby parking lot. The couple were seemingly asking for directions. In a split second, Bernardo pulled out a knife and threatened French, forcing her into the back seat of his vehicle. She would later be reported missing by her family. During her disappearance, French's entire community took part in the search effort. Her classmates, teachers, and friends all wore green ribbons of hope in hopes of finding the teen. We're going to be searching the area, Port Luzi area. Young and old, their faces revealed the grim task ahead. 2,200 people, more than four times the number expected in today's search. You want to know that we are thinking of you and that everything can be done is being done and we'll get you back real quick. Some articles of clothing were found, but police say nothing that can immediately be tied to the case. But on the 30th of April, 1992, worst fears were realized as police found Kristen's naked, lifeless body in a ditch. She had been murdered on the 19th of April, was videotaped by Homolka and Bernardo as they held the young girl captive over three days, assaulting, humiliating her, and forcing her to drink copious amounts of alcohol. On May 15, 1992, the Green Ribbon Task Force was created in an effort to investigate the murders of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. Towards the end of that same month, John Motile, an acquaintance of Bernardo's, reported him as a possible suspect in the murders. Around this same time, Amolka and Bernardo's marriage began to turn sour. On the 27th of December, 1992, Bernardo beat Amolka with a flashlight, bruising her. She would eventually report Bernardo for domestic violence, thus allowing law enforcement to arrest him. I want to do everything I can for you to put that bastard away forever. He doesn't even deserve to live, but I want him to rot in jail because dying is too good for him. Car! Carla! Car! I lost the car! Hey, car! God, God, it hurts. Oh, f***ing it hurts. You're listening to a sobbing Paul Bernardo begging for Carla Hamalka to come back home, back to the marital bliss that was once captured in these photographs, but was shattered in this flashlight attack in January 93. I, I, I smashed the flashlight against my own head. It hurts a lot. I'm sorry. On February 9th, 1993, after being interviewed by investigators about her husband's abuse, Homolka confessed. And uh, then she took a breath. And that freaked me out even more. I w he should have slapped me in the face because I was really hysterical then. So he went over to her and he did the same thing. He strangled her more. And I think I watched that time because what the hell, she's dead anyway. Like. For a tour of the murder scene, the outfit she wore was eerily like that of an innocent schoolgirl. She'd been present for the full horror show but seemed totally detached. Can you answer a question for me? Was any of the furniture damaged as a result of the investigation? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, good, sorry, asking for 
She told her aunt and uncle about Bernardo's multiple assault victims in Scarborough and even confessed to the murders of Mahaffey and French, explaining that there were videotapes of the events. What followed was a fight for freedom between the two spouses. Homolka's plan was to obtain full immunity in exchange for her cooperation in Bernardo's arrest. However, in a call from jail, Bernardo told his lawyer about the incriminating videotapes. He had hidden them in a ceiling light fixture. Bernardo's lawyer, Ken Murray, found the tapes and hid them again. It would take Bernardo's attorney being charged for the tapes to finally come to light. On the 14th of May, 1993, Homolka accepted a plea bargain offering her 12 years imprisonment in exchange for her cooperation. In her statements given to police, Homolka revealed that Bernardo had claimed to have had upwards of 30 assault victims. Furthermore, it is believed that he had other murder victims as well. Her self-confidence, perhaps a feature of extreme narcissism, would come in handy when she showed up in court to testify against her husband. In 1995, Bernardo was tried for the murders of French and Mahaffey. He tried to suggest that the deaths were accidental and that Homolka was the actual killer. But on September 1, 1995, he was convicted of multiple offenses, including two second-degree murders and aggravated assaults. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Deemed a dangerous offender, it is important to note something about Bernardo in hindsight. He was diagnosed with clinical psychopathy, scoring 35 out of 40 in the psychopathy checklist. Homolka scored 5 out of 40. She was released from prison on July 4, 2005, and now lives as a free woman. So what do you think about the horrifying story of the Barbie and Ken killers? Let us know your opinion in the comments section below. At The Decoder, we gather evidence from reliable sources to bring you the truth about true crime. Your support is what keeps us going, so make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons on your way out. And also, don't forget to click the notification bell to not miss any of our uploads. Until next time, stay safe and take care, and we'll see you soon on The Decoder.